All right, hey everyone. Uh, thanks for sticking out to the very end. My name's Rob, and I'm a front end engineer at First Dibs. If you don't know First Dibs, it's an online marketplace for rare and desirable goods. And we sell vintage, antique, new and custom furniture, jewelry, fashion, and art. And our front end team is all in on JavaScript. Our stack is Node, GraphQL, React, Relay. And we have offices in New York and Vilnius. And we're hiring, so definitely get in touch with me if this sounds interesting to you. All right, so this talk is about different ways of loading data in a web application and the trade offs involved. Ideally, we want to minimize the transfer size and the number of round trips before we can display something. I'm going to use a simple app as an example. It's displaying information about JS Congress, and it'll list out the talks, speakers, and let's say you also have the ability to leave comments, so we'll display those too. So the first option for building the API for this would be to use a REST-like REST endpoint. So typically you create endpoints that return one resource per request. And so that would look like something like this. So first we're going to load all the talks using the talks endpoint. And we could use the return talk ID and speaker ID to make additional calls to the speaker endpoint and the comments endpoint to get the rest of the data. And you're going to have to write a bunch of code to coordinate these requests, make sure they're loaded in the correct order, and stuff like that. So this results a waterfall of requests. You can't start loading the speakers and the comments until the first request is finished. And after that, you can make the rest of the calls in parallel. So I'm going to talk about GraphQL now. Um, just a show of hands, how many people are using GraphQL in production? Oh. Um, so, but I'll give a brief overview in case you're not familiar. So it's a language for querying data, and it was developed by Facebook for, to build their mobile apps. And it's published as a specification. So now there's many server and client implementations as well as developer tools, and they all interoperate nicely. All right, so here's a quote from the GraphQL website. It's, GraphQL queries access not just the properties of one resource, but also smoothly follow references between them. While typical REST APIs require loading from multiple URLs, GraphQL APIs get all the data your app needs in a single request. Apps using GraphQL can be quick, even on slow mobile network connections. So one of the main goals of GraphQL is to cut down on round trips. It allows you to query for any amount of nested data in just one single request. So we'll see what this looks like for the conference app. So in GraphQL, we have just one endpoint. It's slash API slash GraphQL. And the client sends a request with a GraphQL query to this endpoint. If you squint at it, a GraphQL request kind of looks like JSON with only the keys. The GraphQL server will process this request and return actual JSON in the same shape as the GraphQL request. And since there's only one request, we don't have to write code to coordinate sending a waterfall of REST requests. So it's pretty common to wrap a REST API with a GraphQL server. It's a mostly low-cost way to start getting the benefits of using GraphQL in your client code without having to rewrite your whole backend from scratch. The next question is, do you get any performance benefits by writing a GraphQL server if all it's doing is wrapping the same REST API? And you're still making all the same requests that the REST version of that app was making, but it will be faster because all those round trips are happening over a fast data center connection. And maybe they're even on the same physical server. And if those REST endpoints return additional data that wasn't requested by GraphQL, it's going to be trimmed down to the slim GraphQL response. And it's that single, small, efficient payload is what gets sent over the slow, unreliable public internet. And there's a few additional GraphQL fields I want to talk about. The first is that every field in GraphQL is a function, and any field can take arguments. So in this case, I added a picture field on the speaker, which accepts the size argument. In your server implementation, you can write a function called a resolver to compute what the results of the field can be. And this gives you a lot of flexibility when you're defining your API. The next GraphQL feature is variables. And this lets you define parameters that a GraphQL query can accept. You then send an additional JSON payload with the variable data. 
GraphQL also supports fragments, and fragments are reusable portions of a GraphQL query. You can define a fragment and reuse it in multiple places in the query, and you can think of it as like a building block of a GraphQL query. Directives are these tokens you can add to almost any part of a GraphQL query, and the spec defines two of them, include and skip, and those let you conditionally request fields from a GraphQL query based on a variable value. And directives are also used for experimental features or framework-specific GraphQL features. You could use them for pretty much anything. And GraphQL also stores subscriptions, uh, so that's real-time updates. And in the case, in this case, instead of having one query getting a response, it's more like an observable. From one query, you receive multiple responses as the data changes. And this is usually implemented with a technology like WebSockets. And GraphQL's built-in type system and introspection makes it possible to build really powerful developer tools. So you get context aware autocomplete and documentation right in your IDE. This video is of Graphical, which is an in-browser GraphQL IDE. There's also editor plugins that give you basically all these same features right in your code when you're developing. And so all these features add up to a great user and developer experience. At first days, we've been using GraphQL successfully for over three years. And while you could build a lot of these features into REST APIs, you wouldn't be able to take advantage of the ecosystem of existing GraphQL libraries and tools. Right, but could we optimize GraphQL even more? And there are downsides to batching up all of your requests. Your page will load only as fast as the slowest piece of data. So one solution is to just make multiple GraphQL queries, and this is the most common approach to this issue. You split your code up into multiple GraphQL queries and execute them as soon as you can. The downsides are you need to write code to coordinate these requests, similar to what we did with the uh, REST requests. And uh, so, in this example, this will, definitely, uh, we, this will definitely speed up the schedule and the speakers, but now the comments will be slower because we had to wait until both the schedule and speakers finished loading before we could even start requesting the comments. And so you could keep reworking this and splitting up into more requests. Uh, the more you do that, you're going to add more complexity to your application. And so there's another approach to this problem, and this is implemented as an experimental GraphQL directive called defer. And it allows the GraphQL server to send data as soon as it's ready without waiting until the entire request is completed. Your client code can begin rendering as soon as it starts getting results from GraphQL. This lets you decide what is the most important thing to show your users and make sure it's not delayed by anything else. So this is what the defer directive looks like. Um, so, so we say that it's slow to load comments in our app, so we added the defer directive to the comments field. And now there's multiple responses. In the first, the comments are null. So this is sent as soon as the, all the data except the comments is finished loading. And then once the comments are loaded, a new response is sent, and that's called a patch response, since it's meant to be applied to the previous response. And the patch response is a JSON object that has a path array which says where in the initial response it gets applied to, and then a data field that says what the data that goes there. So going back to the waterfall chart, this one is exactly the same as the original GraphQL chart, but we're able to start rendering before the comments have finished loading. And there's no overhead added because you don't need to send another request to the GraphQL server. Since we decided to defer, to only defer the comments, we do need to wait for the speakers to load before anything else can be rendered. But you have the choice of rendering earlier too. It's a, it's a trade off of how fast you want your initial render to be versus how many more loading states you want and where you want those loading states to be. So this is a good example of what defer would look like to an end user. 
So there's multiple levels of defer here, and data is incrementally rendered as it's loaded. And if you compare it to the example without defer, the whole page loads when exactly the last piece of data arrives. So there's three cases where using defer is very useful. The first one is when a field is expensive to load. Maybe it's data that's not cached, or data that requires a lot of computation, or just something that's expensive to look up. The second one is when a field is not on the critical path for interactivity. Maybe it's the comment section of your app or something else that's not super critical. And the third one is when a field is expensive to send. Maybe it's not expensive to load this data, but there's just a lot of it. And so that'll be slow to send over slow networks, so it would be beneficial to defer it. All right, so now we're going to talk about how it's implemented. And we're not going to use WebSockets. Um, we're going to use just a standard HTTP connection and send multiple JSON objects over it. So it's one single connection that stays open until all the data is sent. And it's a, uh, a multi part HTTP response. It's similar to like, what's used in file uploads. Um, and we need a client that understands how to parse it. So, a closer look at what the multi part HTTP response looks like it's instead of this one single request with a single JSON object, there's multiple JSON objects. Each part of the multi part response contains the header indicating the content type. And this format allows mixed types, but we're only using JSON for this. And there's also the content length, which lets the parser know how many bytes to read before it can begin parsing the JSON. And after the initial data sent, the connection will remain open until each patch is sent. So this is what it looks like when you make the request on the command line with curl. And you can see how each of the JSON objects are sent over the same connection. They're sent as soon as the data is ready, and the connections close after the last one. Now, here's an example of a standard GraphQL network layer, a network layer being a function that you write that has the logic of how to communicate with your GraphQL server. And usually it's pretty simple. Um, all this one does is make an HTTP request to the GraphQL server and return the results. And so this works for your standard GraphQL use cases, but it has to be more complex to handle the defer directive. So in this example, we've updated the network layer to support streaming connections. The first thing we did was change the interface to act more like an observable instead of returning a promise. So the function we'll call on next every time we have a fully constructed JSON object. And we'll call on complete after the next network connection is closed, meaning that we received all the patches. And this is similar to how GraphQL subscription might work, because it's similar to how there's one request, but then there's multiple responses. And we're using the readable streams API to read the network data. This is a new browser API that's built on top of Fetch. What that allows you to do is you have a reader which, will, which has a callback that gets called as soon as it gets some bytes from the network. And I have an object that I called patch resolver. And this one has a method that will keep feeding the bytes into it. And then that will call on next once it has the full JSON object. All right, so browser support for the readable stream API is, is pretty good, and it's supported in all the recent versions of evergreen browsers. Firefox just added support very recently. It was only in January of this year. And I don't think anyone's surprised that it not, you can't use it in Internet, in Internet Explorer. But you actually don't even need this uh, fancy readable streams API to make it work. You can use just old XML HTTP requests and this works since like Internet Explorer 7. And um, I don't think this technique is used all that often, but I think it's pretty cool. It's been widely supported for so long. So in this example, the on ready state change callback lets us read the current data as it's been loaded 
and we can handle it in exactly the same way as we did before. Uh, so you're probably not going to want to write this by hand in your app. Um, I, in those examples, I also left out error handling to keep it simpler. And um, you could use Apollo Client, uh, which has, it's one of the most popular GraphQL clients, and they have this in an alpha version. And I also wrote an open source library called Fetch Multipart GraphQL if you want to use it without Apollo. So you may have noticed when the initial response is returned, the deferred parts are null. And that can be problematic when you're writing your UI code to display the data. Is it null because it's actually a null result, or is it null because the patch with the data hasn't been loaded yet? Uh, the question is, like, should you render no comments, or should you render a loading spinner? And that's when you're going to want to use a GraphQL client. So Apollo client has experimental support for this directive and, and an alpha release. And so uh, this is a React example, but it could work with any view framework. And they help you solve this problem by passing a loading state object of all the deferred fields that are currently loading. So you can use this object to ensure that your loading states are handled correctly. And Relay is another popular GraphQL client that was open sourced by Facebook shortly after the GraphQL spec was released. And it's what we use at first dibs. Relay currently doesn't support the deferred directive, but it does support subscriptions and observables. So you can use the network code that I showed before to, um, to uh, support defer, but you're not going to be able to solve the null or loading problem until proper support is added. But they are working on it. Um, so I want to show a little bit about how uh, Relay works before I show how you might use defer with Relay. And um, you co-locate a GraphQL fragment with a component, and then that component has access to the fields defined in that fragment. And each component only has access to those fields, so it makes it, it, makes, it gives you a high level of confidence when you're making changes to the component. You know exactly what data is going to be there. And um, you may know about a React feature that's in the works called Suspense which lets components halt rendering until the data they require is loaded. And then what React does is render the closest fallback, which has a loading state until all the data is there. And um, so this is one approach that Relay could take to work with defer. And um, you could defer an entire GraphQL fragment, and then React could suspend the component that's associated with it until the patch is received. And then you don't have to worry about handling null data in the component itself. You know that it won't be rendered until all the loading states are done. There's also uh, a, another experimental directive um, called stream, which could also take advantage of the same type of multi-part HTTP streaming architecture. And this is useful for lists of items. It allows you to start rendering the first item in the list before the rest of them have finished loading. So on small screens, you may only have room to show the first one or two items, so it's nice that you could render that right away without waiting for an entire list to load. This is what the response will look like when you're using the stream directive. So we're going to stream each of the talks, and instead of getting the whole list in one response, first you get the empty array first, then you get a patch for each object that's in the list. And of course, you could use both the defer directive and the stream directive in the same query. So to, to summarize the current status, defer is available in the Apollo alphas, and it's usable in Relay, um, but without the solution for distinguishing between loading and null states. But it's a work in progress. And um, stream is more experimental. It's not supported in either of these. But um, HTTP streaming with XML HTTP requests has been in browsers for a long time. Um, and I think it's very useful, but it's not really widely used all that much. And I think that the community can get very creative designing applications that make use of this, even without GraphQL. And uh, I have a few references. Uh, Lee Byron, one of the GraphQL co-creators, did a really good talk where these ideas were first discussed. 
And um, there's an Apollo, the Apollo blog has a good article on Defer too. And that's all. Thanks so much for sticking it out to the very end.